Hi everyone, this is Greg here and welcome to Just Mean Podcast, where we chat to teams using blockchain technologies to solve real world problems. Uh, today, really excited to chat to Scott Chamberlain of Evernode. Um, they're building a smart contract platform on the XRPL. So uh, yeah, really great to hear from you today and dive into what it's all about. Um, because it's a really important technology for blockchain and um yeah great to see someone's tackling this hard issue <laughs> yeah great great to be here thanks for the invite <laughs> no worries um so sort of jumping straight in uh tell us about yourself how did you sort of get to the point and uh where along the line were you introduced to sort of xrpl and what made you want to decide to build on it uh so my background is as a lawyer and when i was a lawyer i was interested in um technology and automation of the law and the future of legal practice and where it was all going. Um, and had, had a stint at being a, an entrepreneur in that space, um, and took that knowledge then with me to the Australian national university, where I started off in what was called the school of legal practice, where we taught lawyers to be lawyers or law students to be lawyers. Um, and. So, you know, legal innovation, legal technology, had always been an interest. And then this thing called blockchain came along. Um, and the thing that always interested me most about blockchain in the initial days was when you're doing law and tech, everyone would say, yeah, 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 but the computers can get hacked. Yeah, 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 but the computers are unreliable, you know, yeah, 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 but everything could be stolen. And yet here was this blockchain technology with that had been, you know, Bitcoin had been persistent for, for, for years and it was, and it wasn't being hacked and it, you know, and it, it was this distributed system where it didn't matter if one computer was compromised, the, the network persisted and remained reliable and trustworthy. Yeah. That seemed to be a really interesting feature, um, from the point of view of using technology to do legal work. And I do love the idea that, um, you can build systems that anyone can use, that everyone polices and that no one owns. I think that is an important you know, trifecta of attributes <clears throat> for a system where you want to run part of your legal system, or, you know, you want people's legal rights and obligations to in some way be enacted by this system because what's happening in the technology space at the moment, people don't realize, right. But, um, there's no Google when it comes to law firms, right? The law is actually a perfectly competitive industry in the sense that no one firm owns enough of the market to do anything other than do what everyone else is doing. It's why lawyers yeah. look so similar, right? <laughs> it's, they're, they're, it's a commodity in that sense, in a weird way. Um, but what tech will do is create Googles in the law sphere, and then you will end up with large companies that own large chunks of your justice system. Um, and, uh, blockchain is one potential way not to have that happen, I think. So that was my initial interest. And then I delved into it. Um, and I got involved in the XRP community because back at the time it was your hash power for Ethereum and Bitcoin was mostly concentrated in China in about yeah. three or four different, um, mining pools. And if I was going to use this system for smart contracts that might affect people's legal rights, it seemed to me that you wouldn't build it on a system that the Chinese government basically controlled in China <laughs> yeah. controlled, right? Because we just um, had that Pentagon release, didn't we, that, that somehow made its way to the surface a few months after publishing. Um, yeah. yeah. Says, so it, you know, this can be hacked. Like there's only, you know, three or four people can take over the network. Yeah. Well, well right. and it could, right. Yeah. And, <laughs> and they kind of showed it in, in various, you know, there's obviously capacity when the network needs it for a very small group of people who can meet in a hotel in New York to come together and agree to change the code, right? Like it, it's quite, it's possible. Yeah. But um, the XRP ledger in, in contrast, right? You trust who you want to trust. And if they breach your trust, you can just pick it up and take it elsewhere. Well, that seemed to me to be an interesting feature for, for, you know, that that's more how the legal system would work, right? I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. You're untrustworthy. And I don't have a massive investment. That means that I can't now decide not to trust you. All right. 
And that creates its own different problems when it comes to the architecture of the network. But it seemed to me, if I had a smart contract network, then a, a UNL consensus chain is a, is a better chain than, than others where there's economic, you know, perverse incentives. So Ethereum yeah. got the problem, for instance, this minor extracted value where they could pick and choose which transactions to put in a block and, and shift around and, and put themselves before and after and all that sort of stuff. Well, yeah. that's not how you want any party illegal system to run. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, so, so the XRP ledger went to the top of my things that I was interested in and I was always watching it for, you know, back in the day, it was Codius. There was this smart contract platform coming for the XRP ledger. Um, and Ripple had made its decision that it wasn't going to invest money in making smart contracts happen on the XRP ledger. Um, and I, I think time has shown that that's a little bit, not a mistake, but, um, you know, smart contracts have proved to be a pretty useful or interesting, um, and indeed potentially necessary feature. Of yeah. So. That, that was probably always my hesitancy with XRP. Um, don't get me wrong. I, I bought, I bought in a long time ago and, uh, still, still here. Um, right. it's like, how are they you're gonna, where you were, <laughs> how, how are we going to build like this composable system that everyone bangs on about in ETH, like, and you know, disintermediate into in disintermediate the system without, you know, a, a way to encode it. Um, and so that was always a missing piece for me, a brilliant payment, um, you know, and I love like the auto bridging feature and stuff like that, where you just have a currency route and it zaps through in the cheapest way. Like that is incredible. And I can see why they chose to focus on that because it is huge market. We know, uh, remittance, remittances and stuff just costs an arm and a leg for people. So yep. I can see why they focus on it, but yeah, for maybe DAP builders, uh, who want that sort of next level, um, that was. One of the pieces. Well, I mean, it's true to say that the, the XRP ledger had features that weren't a smart contract, but that other chains need smart contracts to have the XRP ledger has it as a native feature. So yeah. escrows, right? Yeah. And, and the DEX itself, right? Um, but that means that you've got to always be improving your suite of native features to catch up with the market. So. I saw David Schwartz had just released his, um, automated market maker proposal. They've, yes. they've opened the GitHub for that. And, um, you know, that's a new native feature. It's not a smart contract. It's a new native, yeah. the, the P ledger that would facilitate native automated market makers. Now that's the sort of, you know, that's one of the missing pieces that the, the XRP ledger ended up having. It's got a DEX, but it's got no liquidity on the DEX. And partly it's got no liquidity because it's got no market makers and you can't have an automated market maker because it doesn't have smart contracts and all yeah. that. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's a, that's a really big, that's a really big improvement, um, assuming that it gets up. Um, but it also means, you know, there's things like, um, algorithmic stable coins, right? These kind of decentralized stable coins. Now I know Luna tanks, you know, they're not having a good run at the moment, right? But... <laughs> things like over collateralized stable coins, where you can over collateralize a vault with digital assets and from it mint something that's worth $1 of something. Um, we discovered in our work that such a thing was actually really useful. So we had a project called digital cows that looked at tokenizing, um, interests in herds of cattle that you could then trade. Okay. <laughs> um, and the, the main, the main, one of the main barriers is that you can't integrate with the banking system. So when the cows are sold and you want to distribute the proceeds of sale, well, you want that in a digital asset form. You want a dollar, an Australian, a digital yeah. version of an Australian dollar that can then be spread out across the network that you're using. Instead, yeah. you'd have to connect via APIs to every single person's bank and, and have access to their bank account and all this sort of stuff. So you could see, you know, yes, this money's gone into the bank account and the API, you know, goes and yeah. tells you that it's there and all, and you can't do it. It's, it's not feasible. So, um, 
you know, CBDCs and stable coins are actually, um, if you go to use dApps for real world, um, things, you'll find that digital representations of fiat money are a necessary feature. Yeah. I, I do sort of deep dives into other ecosystem, always been interested in like, um, with the stable coins that peg to, uh, there's one on FTM, um, that pegs to the price of FTM. So you don't have to use the underlying asset, but you get something that represents it, um, to use in DeFi. And I always found that fascinating and wondered if, I, th I guess smart contracts might've been the missing feature then to you do that in XRP world. Um, but yeah, I'm, well, it, I'm not it, super it, technical. It, but, <laughs> Part of the benefit is because it's cheap and fast and deterministic. Um, so that, um, some of the things you learn when you try and build on the XRP ledger, for instance, you can't batch transactions. Every single transaction happens sequentially. So we, when we do that, because it's the node, we, we've discovered that you can't just go send tokens to everybody. Yeah, no, no, no. It'll send tokens to everybody, one person at a time, and that will take you know, it's three seconds for a transaction, but to send it to a million people is going to take you two hours or something. So, yeah. um, because you, you know, your, your ledger will fill up. So, um, <clears throat> but the benefit of that speed and low cost is, and the determ deterministic nature is there's no minor extracted value. Okay. Um, yeah. So the arbitrage, the pure, you know, your, your market maker has. David's pointed out in some of his posts, right? You'll be able to get that slippage right down. So the price, what would happen in Ethereum is there'd have to be a, a, a you would, the price, the difference between buying and selling would be too great yeah. for it to be worth. It had to be wider for it to be worth someone's while to make a market Yeah, because the cost of the transaction was so high. The spread had to at least equal the cost of the transaction. Yeah. It wasn't making no money out of being an arbitrage. Well, XRP, it's, you know, 0.0002 of an XRP, like it's a fraction of it. Any. Yeah. Um, so it has that, it has that advantage. So talking about Evernote, are you, so Evernote as a concept then is bringing smart contracts to the XRPL. Um, as far as I understand it, it's sort of like account logic. Um, but that was like <laughs> a really high, high level so, view of that. <laughs> Evernote is hard to explain. I know Richard who, uh, Richard Holland, who works at XRPL labs and this was his, um, stroke of genius. Um, he finds it hard to describe because it's not like anything else that's out there. That yeah. that's part of the problem. It's not, it's not a proof of stake. It's, it's not even necessarily a layer two. It's a, it's a something else. So. If we go back and talk about the genesis of it, we, I was successful in, in obtaining a UBRI, a university blockchain research initiative said, grant yep. <laughs> for Ripple for my research. Um, and it was pitched on, you know, using smart contracts to solve real world problems. People say blockchain and smart contracts can do this in the legal sphere. Well, let's try and do this. Yeah. Right? And I reached out to the XRP community and Richard Holland put his hand up and said, yeah, I'm interested. I'll come along and help you. And we worked for quite a bit. We would pick an issue and try and solve it. And the first one we picked was, um, um, identity self KYC on a blockchain, right? Okay. Yeah. We're talking about, oh, you have self sovereign identity. Okay. Let's, <laughs> let's find out. Right. And you quickly realize that, you know, that's a little bit more difficult because KYC has specific laws. People need it, you know, identity proved in a specific way. Um, anyway, we developed a, a working toy of a solution. Um, but we needed a, a different smart contract platform to those that existed. Mm. And from out of those challenges grew, um, the concept of firstly, hot pocket, hot pocket is. Um, Richard did Toast Wallet. I don't, people might not know that, but he was the developer of Toast Wallet, the very first, um, uh, le uh wallet for the XRP ledger. Okay. Um, and so he, he has, he had a, a thing for, he was ahead of the DeFi craze of naming things after foodstuffs, right? Yeah. Cause I was going to so say, I think I, I used Toast, Toast Wallet, wallet. <laughs> back in and, the day. And therefore we had Hot Pocket, right? Okay. Um, yep. <laughs> which is how that name came about. 
as it kind of name it after breakfast foods, right? Next we would have had marmalade jam. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what pocket, what a pocket is, is a consensus engine that you can run on any, um, Linux machine. And if three Linux machines are running hot pocket, you can stitch them together so that those machines maintain a canonical state. Uh, okay. Between each other, right? On a UNL consensus basis. These three machines are part of the unique node list. They listen to each other. They trust each other and, um, they maintain a, a shared state. <clears throat> um, so it's, just, it's as flexible as you can make a decentralized, um, smart contract platform in the sense that anything those machines can do on their own, they can now do in concert. Yeah. Um, so you can input data, they can, they can read, write data, they can perform calculations, you know, they can. You have APIs that go out and fetch data and bring it back and do whatever, whatever, whatever your Linux machine could do on its own. Um, 10 Linux machines stitched together with hot pocket could do as a consent, you know, with, as a consensus network. Yep. Um, then the problem that we had was, um, I could spit up a hot pocket instance on a, on a on a network, um, or sorry, on a server. Um, but to, to do it on 10 servers, if I would be doing each of the 10 servers and yeah. I would own all the 10 servers. So what's the point of having 10 servers located around the world that I control yeah. and calling it a DAP, right? It's like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not solving all that much. Yeah. Um, and what what Evernode solves is that problem. Evernode therefore is, is like a marketplace of machines that are running hot pocket that say to the world, Hey, we run hot pocket. It is, it's got a native consensus environment. Um, Richard calls it consensus as a service. Um, okay. Yeah. Consensus is an operating system. Um, so out of the box, you're running your app on a node that has consensus built into its operating system and can talk to other machines that are similarly configured. Yeah. So Evernote is all these machines running this code that says, Hey, we, we run this code and we're part of the network. And now as a, as a contract, you can upload yourself to any of those servers. Yeah. Um, and stitch them together, whether it's 10, 20, 50, a hundred, uh, take your pick. So what's, what's the sort of, um, implication of that? Like, what's the use case, I guess. So if I'm, so you just said, if, I, I'm a contract, I upload myself, do, do they then execute and then sort of write back to the XRPL ledger that's saying this happened or. That they can't, you can program them to do that. So if every one of those nodes, sorry, every contract needs an XRPL account. Yep because it needs to store the Evers and the XRP that it needs to pay for its fees. Okay. So there's a small so, gas fee, so you, sorry. <laughs> well, Ever, there's a small gas fee then for Evernode. So, paid in Evers. Um, so Evers is the, uh, native currency of the Evernode network. Yep. Um, you pay for your registration of the network in Evers and you pay for your hosting fees in Evers. Okay. So the, the way it works is. You download the software and you register to be part of the network. You pay the necessary fees in Evers to the Evernode hook, right? So there's an account on the XRP ledger. Yeah. That is automated with an XRP with a hook, this new, this super new stuff that Richard. Yeah. Has, right. And so what a hook is, is something that automates transactions to or from, uh, an account. An account. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So instead of me controlling the account, I can give control of the account over to the code. I can make the account its own agent. Yeah. Right. Which, which is huge because at the moment, if I want to automate an XRPL account, the best I can do is split the key eight ways and have those keys controlled by eight different people or eight servers that are owned by eight different people. 
And it's still those eight people that own and control that account. Yeah. Cause there's been a idea that's fascinated me for a long time with blockchain, which is the idea that machines or IOT devices will have their own, you know, payment and they'll receive, maybe they receive information from another Oracle, combine it with their information. They pay the Oracle off, um, and then send it all out and receive payment themselves for the enriched data. And that, it, I mean, that design space just, it, it could be staggering. <laughs> like, um, yeah. And as a lawyer, it starts blowing your mind, right? Yeah. <laughs> you see the idea that machines aren't owned by someone who's responsible for them. Yeah. <laughs> so there's going to be a, a bit of work involved in, you know, what happens when it all goes wrong. Um, yeah. <laughs> but Evernode will allow for contracts. We demonstrated one, we had a, a working toy of, of a, um, of a replicator contract where the, the contracts logic was this load yourself onto one node at a time until you reach 20 nodes. And then after you reach 20 nodes, randomly shut down one node and randomly load yourself up to a new node. Okay. So <laughs> you would just, you would, it would just crawl the network, right? Yeah. Being, and this was to test the concept that, um, for an Evernote contract, it could sense that if one of its nodes has become unreliable, that it could simply unpack itself from that node and go to the registry and choose a, a, a similar node and then upload itself and just keep on going. Yeah. Cause I was going to say that sort of sounds like how a virus <laughs> sort of. It, it's up. a virus. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's a, the difference is that the virus. In order to upload yourself to someone's node, you've got to buy their hosting token. So the okay. way Evernode works as a, as a, and this is why we need the XRP ledger, right? So it's a marketplace of nodes. Great. How does this marketplace function? Well, what happens is as a host, you split your node into slices and each of those slices has a hosting NFT, yep. a lease, which you list on the decks. And the, the lease specifies the slot and it specifies your fee, your rent, um, per hour of hosting in Evers. Yeah. And someone comes along to the decks and acquires that, um, that lease that then represents the right to run a, a, a contract on that instance or on that slice. So I, I have a lease from you for this slot. And now I'm, I'm using my rights under that lease to upload my code to your server. And the purchase price for the lease, the price I buy it from, from the decks is the first hour of hosting. So okay, if you're paying yeah. me two evers an hour, then it gets listed on the decks at two evers. Right. Buy it for two evers. That's the first hour of hosting covered, right? Yep. <laughs> then I use it to buy the first hour of posting. Now, um, I own, I lease that space for as long as I keep paying the rent. Yeah. So every hour I've got to pay you two evers. Every hour, my, the, the XRPL account of the contract has to send you two evers. Okay. Um, and, and if I don't, if I stop paying, then your node unpacks my instance and shuts it down. Well, what it does is it reclaims the lease from me because it's an NFT. You see, yep. you pinch it back and you relist it on the decks. So that NFT is that your sort of self-sovereign ID system in action. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the <laughs> NFTs, you, you can, you can get to that point. Um, the, the benefit of doing it that way is it better replicates how you do hosting, you know, you go to a hosting company and you buy, you, you rent, you know, here it is. And I pay my money and you deduct my credit card every month for the yeah. note. Well, that's how it works, but it's done every hour. Um, okay. So you really come down, I guess, redundancy in the network. Well, of the issue is, is that because we're in a, a decentralized space where you can't afford to trust anybody, um, I might. You might be spoofing your existence as a host. You might list your tokens and you might not have, you know, you might, it all, might all be fake. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, 
And so I will discover that when I try and upload a token to you, right? Yeah. When I try and upload my contract to your host. Um, and so this is structured so that, well, the most that you're risking is two ebbers or yeah. whatever it is. is one hour of hosting, right? It's like 30 cents. Or yeah. Whatever. Which is, yeah, no, a small. <laughs> um, and for 20 cents, I uncover that you're untrustworthy. And now I can tell the world that. Yeah. Right. So that's a pretty expensive form of untrustworthiness that doesn't cost me a lot to uncover. Yeah. Um, the other thing as a host, you are actually, you know, you're providing a service, you're a business, just like any other hosting company, you might get takedown notices or something from the government. They might come along and go, this contract is, you know, it's got illegal content on it or something. Yep. So you need all of the tools to be able to police your host. Yeah. Which would involve, you can always simply pitch back your hosting token. Okay. Yeah. 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 And shut it down. So, so these contracts are a virus that has to pay their way and which you can get rid of from your system at any time. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Really interesting. Um, like I say, I think it would just open up so many, <laughs> uh, options for builders on the XRPL. Um, Absolutely. And we're still exploring what we might use DAX for as opposed to apps, right? So yeah. the issue is why run it on one, why run it on multiple servers owned by multiple people when we might just run it all on one server. Yeah. And there's actually lots of situations where. Um, if the tech exists, you might want to run it on multiple servers for things like, so for instance, our digital cows thing, what we decided was that the stock and station agents were the natural, like custodians of the system. So the people that traditionally buy and sell cows on people's behalf. Yes. And are registered and are licensed and have a trust account and have insurance and all that sort of stuff. Um, it would make sense for them to be the ones that run the nodes. And what yeah. that means is that. Every stock and station agent that wants to participate can, and no one stock and station agent owns the whole, whole system. It's not, it's not Scott Chamberlain coming up with a, Hey, meat industry of Australia. Here's a <laughs> wonderful new trading platform, which I will own everything, right? Yeah. No, it's, it's like, here's this software. You guys can run it. And, um, if you want, there'll be a network yeah. and, and if you care about it, it'll be stable. And if it's really useful, it'll help farmers and, and everybody, you know, deal, trade cows in a different, better way. And that's only possible if it's decentralized. No one owns it. Everyone can police it. Anyone can use it. I suppose there's a bit of a cold start problem there where you need to get a certain number of people bought in still. Mm. Um, but I guess if it's open source software, it's sort of like up to the people then, or. So there's, there's problems to solve. <laughs> One of the reasons we chose identity as our first, um, problem to tackle mm. is that right up front identity becomes a problem with digital cows because, um, farmers are registered yep. and, and you're uh, in Australia, there's a, there's a comprehensive regime regulating, um, cattle and you've got a, a property identification code, you've got a farmer code, you've got right. uh, stock and station agents are registered. Um, the system would need to be open only to, um, licensed, um, trading houses or in yeah. the sense of, to, to professional investors. Yep. Um, so at every level, there's this notion of you need to prove who you are and that you're a farmer and you need to prove that you're a stock and station agent. You can't just get onto the system and go, I'm a stock and station agent. You know, I can, I can do this. So, so there's a notary function at some level, there is a, anyone can join the network, but then you have to go through certain steps to get certain user permissions within the network. Okay. Yeah. You have to do that. You've got to be able to, to get identity. So in fact, the first thing that we would need, the system needs to bootstrap itself is, is a notary market where there's then a first initial notary, right? A person who's trusted to be able to assign user rights. Yeah. It sounds, it just sounds like Russian dolls, doesn't it? Like you, here's a big one. Whoop. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, the game. Oh, now we have to build a smart contract platform. Oh. <laughs> God. Wow. Yeah. yeah this, it is necessary if you want to get to, I mean, we looked at this, um, when you talk about digital assets and whether they're 
one of the key problems with these digital assets is, are they a form of property? And if so, what form of property? Yeah. And because traditionally information isn't property, it's just data. Like if, you know, if you enter into your, if you've got an Excel spreadsheet and it's a list of people you owe money to, um, and you, it says you owe Scott a hundred dollars yeah. and then tomorrow you wake up and you delete that reference. Yeah. <laughs> you still owe me a hundred dollars, right? The fact that you deleted that information didn't change anything. Yeah. yeah. But with these de decentralized systems, you, you got to the point where the data is, um, certain enough, transferable enough. It has enough propertyness to be a form of property. Yeah. Um, and you don't get that if it's run on a central server, you know, if Qantas frequent flyer points aren't a form of property because they just exist on Qantas's Qantas, yep. central server, right? Which they can simply delete at any one time and, you know, fiddle with and play around with. So, um, if you want to have these, if you want to have these data as a form of property, then my argument is you do need a decentralized system in yep. order to give it the necessary elements of propertyness. Yeah. And it's like, you want that to be, um, sort of un, not, not be able to mess around with it. Like our example with when Bitcoin back in the day was very concentrated in China, that could be an issue. <laughs> yeah. So I, look, I have to admit, right. The, you know, when China shut down mining in, um, mining in China, it was, um, you know, the. Bitcoin network didn't miss a beat. The miners picked up and the hash power went down, but then it yep. all emerged somewhere else in the world. So you'd have to say that was, you know, it passed that test. Bitcoin yeah. is incredibly resilient. Um, and it's proved it. Yeah. That, that China thing vanished as a concern. It was, it was amazing how quickly the network simply yeah. <laughs> just, just went elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, so coming on to just conscious of time, just, uh, sort of what's next. So you just released a beta net so, for people. So Evernote is, yeah. So Evernote for, for up until now, Evernote's been run as a research project inside the ANU and inside the school of law as a, Hey, can we build a different, better smart contract platform? And in the context of that research, we built toys of our IXRPL self KYC solution. We built a toy of digital cows, um, yep. and we've done a bunch of, um, contracts on hot pocket networks. We did an NFT <coughs> toy, um, where the, the image and all the data is actually stored on the chain and we did okay, yeah. a replicator contract. Uh, we also built, um, a toy version of an EVM, so an Ethereum virtual machine, uh, contract. So what, what's possible on hot pocket is, oh, sorry, on Evernode is, um, a contract that is, um, you simply cut and paste your solidity contract and up, upload it and it works. Okay. Nice. <laughs> on Evernode, right. Um, uh, that's completely possible. And so having done all of that, we're now at the point of, okay, we can see if this can work in the real world and we're running our beta tests. So we've called for a bunch of people to help us by running nodes around the world. And yep. we've got 28 nodes of various different shapes and sizes near different locations. Yeah. Um, and that's been invaluable because you can, you know, this tech, it worked wonderfully on the machines that are sitting just over there, <laughs> Yeah. um, that we all control and that we tweaked and we set up and, you know, funnily enough, when you, when you configure your server, there's so many, you know, different settings and you're not even conscious that you've made any choice that in that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so having 24, 28 people from around the world use, you know, set up nodes that we can try and deploy a contract to has been invaluable. Uh, we don't know how much you don't know until you teach it. <laughs> yeah, like, just, just, like, what, why is, why is your server set up that way? What do you mean by this? You know, how does, um, uh, the most recent one was some, some servers didn't have IP tables, IP tables or whatever. It's a thing for Linux. Now 
I don't know, but we didn't know that we needed to provide it as part of the Everload package, yeah. Evernote package, because every machine we'd ever used already had it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it's not, you know, it's not guaranteed. So that was, that was the most recent one. Um, and we're going through a process at the moment of uploading, um, a, you know, a very simple contract to every machine just to see that we can deploy contracts. Yep. And we've now successfully done that, which is fantastic. You know, that that's absolutely brilliant. Like it's, we've got 28 nodes that have downloaded software. That software has connected them to the registry book on yep. the on the XRPL test net. Yeah. That hook has recorded their registration, taken their fake evers, issued them with a registration NFT, and now they're part of the registry. Yeah. And then using that registry, we've been able to find them on the registry, purchase one of their, um, hosting tokens, and then redeem that hosting token for a spot on their server and then successfully uploaded a contract to the server. Okay. So yeah, yeah, that's that, you know, that's, that's NFTs, that's hooks and that's hot pocket slash Evernote slash Sashimono. That is a whole bunch of, you know, brand new tech that's all actually worked. Yeah. So far, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, we've got a couple of servers that for some reason are just super slow. Um, so they've successfully uploaded the contract, but it's performing really badly. Okay. And we need to find out why that's happening. And funnily enough, it's happened on the beefier servers. So we think what's happened is, um, our software has sliced the server into, or the slices it's used is uh, too small. It needs, it needs okay, to be Yeah. For some reason, something about having a bigger server means that Evernote went, Whoa! We can have 96 instances on this. No, 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 no. You can't. You can only probably have 45 or something. Like, <laughs> yeah. Max, okay. max instances. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's actually right. is something, right? <laughs> Cause it's on the BFU machines. Yeah. Um, and then our next step after that will be to deploy, um, replicator contracts. So we want to get to the point of being able to upload say three or four contracts that have this logic of grow to 10 nodes yeah. and then shut down a node and upload a new node. Yeah. So they crawl the, the beta net and, um, we see how it responds to, um, to the different environments. Thankfully, you know, a bunch of people have got unreliable nodes. Some people are actually running this software on their laptop that they switch off at night. Nice. <laughs> um, and. That's actually really handy for us because yeah. we need to know what happens when a node is unreliable. Does the contract, you know, does it, does it properly sense that it's unreliable? Does it yeah. you replicate itself somewhere else, et cetera. Um, so that's our next step. And then after that, we'll blow up, we'll, we'll open the beta up to anyone who wants to run a node because I mean, we, imagine if we had a hundred people around the world and we all had, and it's like, oh, you all have to restart everything because yeah. <laughs> We got this little thing. You need IP tables. So please everyone restart. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, hopefully we'll be on those problems. And then we're into the tools necessary to help people build contracts, build and deploy contracts on Evernote. Yeah. So still a, a fair amount of work to do. It sounds like <laughs> there's, there's a lot of work. Well, there's a lot of work to do and a lot of it. We could only do once. You know, it's, it sounds funny, but we needed, we need the public to test the, you know, we, we could build software tools yeah, and then discover that something that was wrong with how the network is set up means we had to go right back. So this, yeah. this, is, the, this is how it has to happen. Here it is. Play with it. Are you broken? Thank you for breaking it because now we know what's wrong with it. Um, let's do something. Let's, let's tweak it and move on. Yeah. No, amazing. Um, I think, I think that's probably a good point to sort of, uh, leave it it sounds like um yeah got a plan for the next few months years <laughs> well we 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 you know we're dependent on nfts we're dependent on books uh, well, okay a little bit dependent there is a set there's a current amendment um that richard put into the mix for us 
which is to expand the signer list from eight to 32. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's an amendment that is beneficial to Evernote because, um, every Evernote, um, DAP will have an XRPL account. Yeah. And what you will want is that XRPL account to be controlled by the nodes in your network. Um, and 32 is a better number than eight. Eight's like too small. Right? Would you, would you want that to tend to as many as possible or it would yeah, 32, so, yeah, as many as possible, ideal. right? So 32, okay, yeah. it's, gonna, it's gonna be a rare DAP that wants more than 32 nodes. Yeah. Uh, they'll exist. But remember every time you're running on someone's nodes, you got to, you, you pay for it. Won't be that expensive, yeah. but you got to pay for it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, sp I suppose there's a few uh, dependencies in the mix, like the XLS. Yeah. So, so the upgrade and they've asked the law of saying whatever time it takes for those things to happen, mm -hmm. we will use those times to, to that time to build out software development yeah. tool to help people deploy stuff to Evernote and to work our out on our own, um, our own projects. Yeah. Cause it, yeah, it's quite different to, I guess, what people would be used to say if they're coming over from Ethereum and something. So it's going to be some old it, It's in. completely different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You don't just, you know, bring it across and yeah. <laughs> and, and off you go. Off yeah. you go. <laughs> the first question might be, why is it so cheap? Um, <laughs> it's good problem. Um, good problems. <laughs> well, you know, so look, you can do things like you can have 32 nodes, right? And you're running and for whatever reason, your node needs to know what temperature it is in Canberra. And so you've got to, you've got to go out and ping the Bureau of Meteorology website and ask it, what's the temperature in Canberra? Well, Ethereum can't do that, right? It needs an Oracle network to make that happen. But yeah. how you can do it with Evernode is your DAP can, can agree on five of the nodes to dial out to the bomb website. Okay. Yeah. Themselves find out what they think the temperature is and then agree amongst themselves as a mini consensus round. Yeah. The temperature is, and then report that to the rest of the network as the canonical answer to what is the current temperature in Canberra. So you get an on-demand Oracle type solution and you can do it because Evernode, um, nodes, you, you can read, write, you can, you know, you can fetch data, you can perform computation. Those, those five could perform some sort of computation on it. Take this number and do a whole bunch of stuff to it and tell us what the answer is. Yeah. And then once you've, once you've done the answer, that becomes the agreed answer for the network. That's it sounds like. You can build hugely complex systems. I mean, where uh, Ethereum is a great example, you need Chainlink and all these other stuff yeah. sort of tied together. It, it sounds like you've got, I wouldn't say simple maybe, but uh, quite a elegant <laughs> solution almost. It's, it's elegant, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's not simple, but it is elegant. <laughs> no, that's a uh, fascinating. All right. Well, and, uh, and that's, that's Richard's genius, right? Yeah. I have to keep giving a call out to Richard Holland. He really is, um. You know, it's, it's his thinking that's made this possible and it's a development team. So it's his thinking plus a dev team in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Which given the political state in Sri Lanka at the moment, they're doing yeah. a, they're doing a Herculean job of, um, of making this thing come to fruition, given yeah. what's going on in their country. So we've got a great little team that's building these things. It's quite exciting. Okay. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I'll uh, wrap it up there and, uh. Let you get back to tea and you can like, see our daughter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Um, yeah. Brilliant to have you on and, uh, thanks for your time again. Uh, anyone who's still listening, get involved, give us a like, subscribe and, uh, let us know what you think. And, um, yeah, hopefully chat to you again soon when, uh, the next part of the platform launches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. There'll be lots more to talk about. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Okay. Cheers. Bye.